um, you know, you see the title there, Are We Alone? And, uh, you know, we're going to talk about that. But I guess, you know, I'm, first off, I'm Chris Rose. I'm professor of engineering here. I also wear another hat. I'm a, in the dean of the faculty's office. And my superpower is that I, I'm kind of broad in my technical reaches. So I'm trying to drag together folks across Brown to do really interesting projects that span multiple disciplines. So this talk is kind of emblematic of, uh, you know, my way of looking at things. So, you know, I wanted to say that right up front and, you know, because I'm, I'm just an interesting sort of guy, but you'll find out that all the professors that you've seen here, you know, we're all kind of interesting in our various sorts of ways. So with that, um, I was invited here by Maud Mandel. Have, has everybody met Maud yet? Uh, Maud Mandel, she's the dean of the college. Right, so she's really in charge of, you know, your kids making sure that, you know, they're you know, safe and happy and wonderful. So, you know, why, why are we giving these talks? So one other thing is that we're, this is the technology side of things. I looked at all the other talks. There's not a science-y or, you know, technology sort of thing. So you think that there's nothing happening at Brown in science and technology, right? No, we have a Nobel Prize. No, excuse me, we have two <laughs> Nobel Prizes, you know. So uh, it's some real stuff happening here. But why do we give these talks? And I could hear in the email that Maud sent, you know, you, you could just read it in between the lines. Um, what you want to do, Chris, is, you know, <laughs> we are friendly scholars, right? We're really, really friendly scholars. I, you know, I could almost hear that. And the thing that hit me was that as a technical sort of person, you know, I'm used to getting up and uh, throwing up slides and trigger warning for some of you. You know, there's uh, lots of equations and things like that. And uh, I think the subtext of that was really, don't scare you. <laughs> so I'll, I'll try not to scare you. Um, but there's an even, there's a subliminal message in all of this as well. And it's really, you know, your children's minds are safe with us. Uh, <laughs> and exactly, <laughs> really. Oh, you know, how many of you have uh, children that are in the sciences or doing, cal at the freshmen are probably all doing calculus, yeah, and they are getting, yeah, and I, I can see by your faces that you've probably had the midnight call, mom, dad, I don't know what's happening here and help me. Um, but, you know, that's part, of the, that's part of the structure, that's part of everything, and it'll all work out. You know, trust us, it'll all work out. This, I've, never, I've been at a number of universities, I've never seen this sort of advising. That I have, a, I have a whole herd of six ducklings that I carry around with me and, you know, make sure that life is going well for them. So, you know, yes, your children's minds are safe with us. So, you know, one of the things that um, folks often ask is, why do we do what we do? You know, there are people that work on Wall Street that quants, people that do stuff that I actually do, that work on Wall Street, and they bring in their $10 million bonuses, and I do not under, I'm not exaggerating. Um, no, we're not paid that much. Um, <laughs> so why do we do what we do? Well, there, there's some truth to it. Um, <laughs> truth is, we're, we're all a little crazy in, in some respects. We have, we, we see the world in a different sort of way, and we try to quantify it in a different sort of way. So I'm going to try to you know, give you a feel for that, at least in the technical side of the house. You got that um, in the morning sessions. And I'm really surprised. I'm stunned and thrilled and pleased that there's more than one person here, given that the other session is all about the election. Uh, so I guess uh, so I, I won't talk anything about that. So you know, this is like a respite. <laughs> so good, this is a respite session. All right. So. You know, and our motivations can be odd. So before I launch into the technical stuff and make your eyes glaze over, um, what I'm going to do is tell you a little bit about how I got into this stuff. And, and to do that, we have to go back in time. Um, so specifically, uh, I'm a communication theorist. Uh, what that kind of means is I don't have a cell phone, but you know, anything, information, if it passes over wires through the air or whatever, that's my domain. That, that's what I do. I worry about how to do it efficiently. Uh, how to do it with reliably, and uh, it's all about information passage. So we'll go back to 1957. Um, a lot of you are young, ger, right? Uh, some of you are not so young, but uh, 1957 was a big deal. Uh, that's when the first satellite went up, and it wasn't ours. It was the USSR's. And if you remember from the history, um, this was an interesting sort of time. So the whole notion there was that, my goodness, there's this bird, as satellites are called. It's hurtling across the air. That means you can launch stuff, oh goodness, and you can launch stuff from Russia and drop it 
on places in the US. So this was real fear that uh, developed. So my background is such that I was raised during this period of fear, existential fear, as opposed to you know, other sorts of fear, where you could wipe out the eastern seaboard. And uh, technology was king. And the king of the technologists uh, were the physicists. These are the ones that, uh, you know, so science was king. So something else happened in 1957. Um, yes, I know. <laughs> Not really. Yeah, that's me. Um, in the egg. So 19, and I was born early in 1957, so I was actually alive when Sputnik went up. So this kind of uh, molded and shaped me. I was in an era where STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, or medicine, any but math, was king. You really needed a lot of people, so my education and everything was um, predicated on the notion that we, can, we have this Cold War, essentially, and an arms race and everything else that came with it. All right, so during this time, physicists, you know, they're the superheroes. So, you know, and not being a physicist, I mean, kind of a physicist, but not really. That's always kind of bothered me. Uh, you know, a little bit of physics envy. Now, you got to give the physicists, you know, a little bit of props. You know, they had a few minor successes. Um, for those of you that don't know, that's the first transistor. That's, a, that's enshrined at the Old Bell Laboratory, so I don't know. The Old Bell Laboratory isn't the, old, isn't the laboratory anymore. And uh, we all know what that is. Um, you know, rather impressive, you know, in some sorts of ways. So there are a lot of physics successes. So now, intercommunication theorist, right? And, you know, that's kind of the way I feel sometimes. Uh, you know, not capitalized, all lowercase. Um, but, and that really, really, really bugs me. Okay, because, you know, look, I mean, we invented cell phones, we invented the internet. I probably shouldn't have used this picture, because this one, because <laughs> that one catches fire. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, you know, that the internet, telecommunications, all of the things that we take for granted and that will have an increasing, I mean, um, I won't be political, but I mean, one of the things, the foment that's uh, in the world today is really owed to cell phones and the fact that you can take a cell phone and record your surroundings, and that's communications. So, you know, that's kind of always bothered me. But, you know, the bottom line is at a cocktail party, hey, I do communication theory. That's the response uh, most of the time. And, uh, you know, <laughs> you, can begin to, you can begin to kind of take it to heart and, you know, run and hang your head. So, you know, what's the first thing that you would do? You know, you look to popular culture, right? Scientists are, you know, really wonderful and we're supposed to be uh, lauded. And uh, how many of you know this series? Oh, oh yeah. are you afraid to raise your hand, or there's only really a few folks? <laughs> okay. All right, so I'm going to ask you one question for those folks who know what this is. This is the Big Bang Theory. Uh, aside from Penny, who's the only normal human being there, um, what's the, uh, who's the lowest person on the technical totem pole there? So, you know, let's, uh, so, oh, no, so, who? Oh, how, oh, this guy. Yeah, the, the MIT trained <laughs> engineer, right? Not a physicist. Everybody else a physicist, biologist, or whatever. So, you know. Oh, yeah, and a PA. You know, no, trust me. Uh, if you've had, how many folks are familiar with Caltech, with, where this is based? OK, so you know Caltech. There's the engineering division. OK, so it's kind of like the stepchild of everything else, <laughs> even at Caltech, even with a PhD. So, you know, I have friends there. And they visited. So that's one thing. So this is a constant barrage. You know, the, the, the media, everybody is telling you, well, you know, you're just a communication theorist, just an engineer. So what's the first thing that you would do when you think about that? Well, you, what I do is, you know, I go to the person that's known me the longest. You know, you, obviously you talk to your parents, but, you know, they don't quite know what you do. But, you know, I have a sister who is uh, also an academic. You may have seen her this morning. And, um, you know, you say, Tricia, you know, wow, it's, it's really tough being a communication theorist. You know, what can I do um, to make everybody understand that communication theory is at the core of everything? You know, everything talks to everything else. And, you know, please, Tricia, help me. And Tricia, she's really wonderful and she's really warm. And, that, you know, she's the perfect sister. But, you know, it's like, well, Chris, just, just hold on. You know, I'm sorry. I can't really talk about that right now. You know, the world is burning down around us. 
and I've got to go on national television to fix it. <laughs> so, you know, Trisha is a public intellectual, and uh, she's uh, in demand. Everybody wants to hear about Trisha. So, no, no sucre there. So, where do we go? Got to go to my wife, right? My wife's going to help me. Right? She's, you know, we're married 32 years. She knows me. She, she married me before I uh, got a PhD. And uh, you, know, you figure she's going to help. And I, the same spiel, you know, Steph, please, you know, help me out here. What, how can I position this, whatever? And, you know, well, there's Stephanie. And, you know, <laughs> and, and, you know she's going down to Manhattan, you know, doing that thing she does. Um, this was an article in Cranes. So, you know, no sucre there. So I have a friend. He's a physicist. Now, you know, that's, that's a problem in and of itself because physics, you know, they're higher on the totem pole. But you figure they don't understand what's going on. So, you know, I can go talk to Jim, and actually Jim is visiting here as a professor. Maybe we can lure him here. You know, we should clap really loud for Jim. But, uh, you know, sorry, Chris, I, I got to run down to D.C. and get this metal thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, everywhere I turn, you know, there's, a, there's, there's, there's no reaffirming anything. So one of the things that you'll learn about academics, if you haven't learned already, is that we like to do a sort of judo. So what we do is, Right? If whatever area it is, okay, mine is yours, right? Mine encompasses yours. So that has been my way of looking at things. That's actually been my way of looking at things for a while. So what I'm going to tell you today is a, uh, tell you a story about a particular piece of work that grew out of kind of mundane wireless communications. But if you look at things in the big picture, you can end up actually asking and answering some big questions. Now, am I going to tell you, are we alone? Or are we not alone? No, nobody knows that just yet. But I am going to tell you about some physics communication theory, mainly communication theory, that hints that how we learn whether we are or not may come from a completely different direction than most of us uh, have been inculcated to believe. OK, so you know, here's something that communication theorists know and have known for a long time. And it seems like it's really. Uh, um, trite, but it's actually very true, and there's, there's some physics behind this. So you think of the internet, you know, I've got my gigabit internet, and it's really fast. Well, if I want to get massive amounts of data from one place to another, right, I don't have my phone right here, but in my phone, there's a little tiny chip, smaller than my pinky fingernail, that has 10 gigabits on it. So seems like if I really want a high bit rate channel, I can take that chip and throw it to you. Now you say, oh, come on, that's not electronic. Doesn't matter, right? We're getting information from one place to another, and we're doing it physically. So that's what that is. And that's in the communication theory zeitgeist, and has been for a while. Uh, Paul Barron, who was one of the inventors of the internet, um, he actually used to ship tapes across the world. Uh, because back then, there was no uh, communication channel wide enough, big enough, to be able to carry all that information. So they pack it into a plane. He worked for Sperry at the time. Pack it into a plane and send it to wherever it needed to be sent. Uh, there's other things, right? The old spy satellites. Uh, there were no communications links down fast enough to get the pictures down. So they'd take the pictures and they'd jettison the, uh, the canister and it would fall back to Earth. And you'd actually pick that up and read it. And that's another form of matter-based information transfer. FedEx is another obvious example. You know, we're in a paper-free society, right? Um, and uh, Netflix, though, I think the Netflix, I, st I still have a Netflix DVD uh, uh, subscription. I've never gotten one in the past five years. So I, I, I don't know. But with the attacks that are going on, maybe I'll start back and they'll start sending the DVDs out. So the point is, these are things that we all know. And you know, there's even some fun stuff. right? So I wrote this paper that I'm going to talk about today. <laughs> all right, so, yeah, so you know what these are, right? <laughs> yeah, those are disks. And they got information on them. And uh, what this guy did, he read my paper. And he said, this is, this is an analog of what you're talking about. So this is a, now this is a very frighteningly large snail. Okay, this is, this is actually two scale. That snail is like big, this, you know. And what it's doing is it's dragging these DVDs across a room. And, you know, it's being lured. But the funny thing is, if you actually do the calculation, it turns out that the data rate that this system achieves is better than a, a digital subscriber line. <laughs> There's some delay. 
right? <laughs> you know, maybe you won't get your movie right away, but uh, you know, you'll get it. And the actual data rate is higher, is the point. So you know, that's, that's the fun stuff. But now, you begin to ask a fundamental question. What is the trade-off? So if I, if I get really close to somebody and toss it, toss the information, should I have been yelling it or should I have been tossing it? And so when you, reify, when you structure that down or distill that down to the actual scientific question, the question is, what's the cost of radiating, that's radio, optics, whatever you know, you'd like, acoustics if you want, versus writing it down and tossing it. So you, know, you put it that way, but now you get back into the physics, information is bits, and this is an audience at this point, uh, yes, ma many of us are visitors or newcomers to the digital world, all the kids are, you know, they were born in it, so everybody knows what bits is, unlike 25 years ago when if I'd given this lecture I couldn't I have to tell everybody what a bit was. But everybody knows what bits is. It's your songs, it's your mute movies, it's your content. And then the other thing is energy. How much energy does it take to deliver a piece of information from hither to young? And that's what I'm gonna talk about. With, hopefully without frightening you. All right, so, oh God, oh God, there's an equation. <laughs> uh, so here's what's going on here. The big green one, see, because I'm, I'm technical. Uh, <laughs> this is a radio. It's radiating energy, and it's being picked up by a receiver. And that's all you need to know about that picture. Here's the matter transfer. We wrote something down in a little blob of matter, and we literally kicked it. I'm, I'm not joking. <laughs> literally kicked it from one place to another. Uh, now, you have to do, you have to compare apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So light takes, light is an instant, so it takes a little bit of time to get there. So what we're doing is, this period of time, the radio is sending its message, sending its message, sending its message, sending its message, and then it stops here, and at exactly that time, that's when the blob arrives. So we're comparing apples to apples. Information delivery via matter, information delivery via flapping your radio. Now, we need to talk a little bit about the energetics of this. But first, I have to define a couple of new units. So there's this cool new unit that popped out of this called mass information density. So how many of you have ever heard of uh, the number of bits per kilogram? Right? I mean, it's just not, <laughs> it's not what you think of. But we have to think of it here, number of bits per kilogram. And I'll, you know, we'll play with that a little bit. I want to quick get this out of the way. This is, you know, it's important. but. The key here is if it's absolutely, positively got to get there right away, then you want to radiate it because there's nothing faster than light. And if you try to get mass up to the speed of light, remember what happens? Right? Infinite energy right? E equals mc squared. Can't do it. So there's this thing called transport latency. And what that delta is, is if it's one, you're going at the speed of light. If it's small, you're not moving at the speed of light. So here, this kind of sachet that I'm doing for you, I'm at about a billionth the speed of light right now. You know, so that was, that, and I'll do it again, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> That's a billionth the speed of light. So that would be delta equal 10 to the ninth. Okay, uh, for those of you that uh, don't like the science sort of stuff, 10 to the ninth, one with nine zeros after it, and there's gonna be a lot of exponents in here, so I'm telling you ahead of time. Okay, so. When you think about bits per kilogram, you say, what is this unit? Can I, can, does it make any sort of sense? Well, it turns out that if you take just regular old printer paper, 20 pound printer paper, and print on it with dots, like with a laser printer, the number of bits that you can get on it, you can get 20 billion bits per kilogram. That's not great, right? But, you know, that's, it gives you something to hold on to. Uh, DVD, trillions of bits per kilogram. If you start getting kind of technical, where you actually start inscribing things at very, very small scales, you can do better and better and better. That's a scanning, tunneling, a microscope. So, you know, really teensy sort of stuff, actually putting atoms in place. But here's kind of something cool. Two things that already exist and we know already exist have incredible information densities. The DNA, RNA in our bodies, the proteins in our bodies, the way, uh, well, not the proteins specifically in our bodies, but if you used proteins to code information, you could put, you know, I, 
I don't think I have the quintillion, septillion. I, I don't have a number. It's a one with 25 zeros after it, and you know, about twice that for proteins. Roughly, you know, about a factor of 10 lower for RNA. So the point is, you can pack an awful lot of information onto a very, very little bit of matter, is the point. So the whole Library of Congress has a one with 14 zeros after it. This is, a, is 10 uh, billion times larger. So we could put 10 billion uh, libraries of Congresses into uh, RNA of a kilogram, you know, a brick. So, you know, that, that's a little startling when you actually lay it out. The next thing is, you know, what are the energy requirements? Well, it turns out it's really easy. I mean, that, I, could, I could have frightened you by saying, well, you know, we have this piece of matter and we've got to move it from here to there, and how should we do it optimally? It turns out that the optimal way to do it is to literally just kick it. Just like you do with retro rockets and, and with rockets. Notice the burns on rockets that are sent to orbit. They're as short as possible. That's what it is. They're just kicking the thing, so that's the minimum way to, minimum amount of energy you need to use. Uh, these things that some of you, uh, we're torturing some of your kids with right now, okay? Uh, this one is kind of obvious. Uh, that's the amount of matter that you need. There's the number of bits. That's the bit density. So bits times the density tells you how hefty a package you need. And then this, many of you will, re well, I think many of you will recognize that's just the kinetic energy. How hard did you kick it? And how fast is it going? And that's it. Very, very simple. Okay. Now, here, oh, here we go again. There's, there's a radio, and it's going over there, and there's some more equations. Oh, dear God, what's going on here? Well, here's all that matters. <laughs> At the receiving end, big ears are good. Big ears mean that you collect a lot of energy. The bigger your ears, the more energy you collect. Okay? And it turns out that a big mouth is good, too. And I couldn't find a picture, a right picture of a big mouth uh, that made any sense, but everybody knows this picture. That's Star Wars, right? So it's a big old dish, and it focuses, I, oh, I used the wrong word. It collimates the energy and sends it in one direction. So a big mouth is good. You can direct your energy with a big mouth. With big ears, you can hear a lot of, you can get a lot of uh, energy. And communication is all about energy. So drum roll, please. Okay, I would genuflect. Right, thank you. Right, da, 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 da. Claude Shannon. Um, um, yeah. He is the priest of uh, information theory. Everything in all communication is, traced, is traceable back to Claude Shannon, who is no longer with us. Um, that equation, don't worry about it, but what it tells you is how many bits per second you can get from here to there under certain energy constraints. And this is radiative, this is for radiation. Okay, so that's what that equation tells you. Now, we could do a whole bunch of derivations and whatever else, you know, and I'm look, you're looking at me, because <laughs> I told you earlier, you know, I'll try not to frighten you, and some of you are looking at me like, yeah? Where, where are you going with all of this? Um, so I'll keep it simple, and it really is, but I don't have to keep it simple because it is simple. The thing that you care about is how much energy you need to radiate, yep, 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 how much energy you need to write to get the same information across. That ratio, if it's bigger than one, radiation is bad. If it's less than one, radiation wins. So more energy for radiation, bad for radiation. Less energy for radiation, good for radiation. Right? So it's all about using the least amount of energy. And that's kind of a precept and a construct that lives in the physical world, lives in biology. Energy use is really important. All right, now, I'm, I'm prefacing this, OK? Oh, God. All right. And you're saying, what the hell? <laughs> why, why is he doing this to us? Um, because I do it to your students, OK, and to your kids. And, but here's the thing. I mean, we could have gone through a whole big derivation here. But what I always tell my kids, and sorry, you know, you're, you're, you're young, you're lovely, uh, you know, freshmen, juniors, sophomores, seniors, even your graduate students, to me, they're all kids at this point. Anybody under 45 for me at this point is a kid. Many of you are children. Um, what you got to do is at the end of the derivation, when you're all done, you got to look at the thing and see if it makes any sort of sense. So let's just look at this, and I think, you know, you'll be able to uh, agree with me that this makes kind of sense. So there's that omega thing. So if it's bigger, that means that it favors matter. You should write things down and send it. If it's smaller than one, smaller, then it favors radiation. 
So here's that thing right there. So that's the, um, the way, how much information you can pack into a piece of matter. Well, if that density is larger, then that means that it's going to be easier energetically to get it over when it's written. So the larger that is, the bigger that gets, the more it fade affairs writing. Okay, so that's a good thing. This thing is how far away the thing that you're trying to communicate is with. So we're in this room now, and we'll cover the mic, right? Um, and they're probably really pissed off about that, but that's okay. Um, if you were, you're in the room, you can hear me. My voice is dispersing. If you were outside of this room, even if we took the whole building away and put you across the street, could you hear me as well? Oh, oh, how about I put you about a mile away? Could you hear me as well? So what happens with radiation is that it disperses. And when it disperses, you can't hear it. It also means that the information content that you act that actually flows doesn't get there as well. So this is good. And it disperses, by the way, spherically. So it disperses as the distance squared. So for those of you that care, that's because, it, you know, thinking of a sphere, the surface area sphere goes as the distance squared. So the energy density goes down as the square of the distance. So that's fast. Oh, he, oh here are our uh, mouth, and, uh, mouth and ears, the area of them. So if I got a big ear and a big mouth, that's going to help radiation because that's on the denominator. It's going to make this quantity smaller. And then the last thing is if I can do a leisurely passage, meaning that number is larger than one, we're not going at light speed, that's also going to favor matter. So that's the fundamental equation. Yeah, it had to be derived. Yes, there were a couple of tricks that had to happen, but you know, that's, that's what we do, right? We, we uh, make things simple. <laughs> right, you think, yeah, that's simple. It is, it really is. And I talk about, I talk about this, but it's a, uh, well, I should talk about that. In that noisy environment that I talked about, if it's a lot more noisy, can you hear as well? Well, that's gonna screw up communication as well, the radiative communication, and that'll make things uh, favor matter. All right, so with that equation, let's quickly go through a bunch of things. So we've got 20 minutes. I think we're just, uh, I think we're doing okay. So now here's the weird thing. What you gotta do when you have a result like that is you gotta exercise it. There's some big numbers floating around, but you gotta see if it makes any sort of sense. Is it twice as, uh, twice as good to send things using matter than it is using radio? Is it 10 times? Well. Even for this simple, simple, simple sort of scenario where we're talking about literally taking something from here and getting it to there with, you know, a couple of seconds transit time, turns out that if you could write things down in RNA, we can't do that yet, by the way, not uh, effectively, not quickly, not efficiently, but if you could, the amount of energy it would take to get something from here to there is 10 million times less than if you used radio. You know, it's like, what? Right? That doesn't make any sort of sense. But that's what the numbers tell you. So, you know, you'll believe me here, and then we can beat up each other later, you know, make sure that I'm not lying to you. Um, and you can do that further and further and further. Now, I am ignoring a couple of things. You know, farther away we go, we know there's this thing like air resistance. So just imagine that we're on the moon doing this, right? No air. Uh, the point is that the delays are not so ridiculous and the gains are really pretty incredible. 10 to the 10th, that's, uh, what, 10 billion times more efficient. And this is, you know, this is terrestrial. We're right here on the ground. All right, so let's go down to smaller scales, like where we have inside uh, this computer, there are chips talking to each other. So maybe, uh, you know, maybe matter-based communication sucks there. Well. The short answer is no, and you know, describing what this is, this is just a laser, it has a certain size mouth, uh, there's a receiver, it's at a certain temperature. Well, once again, these are the numbers that are kind of interesting. They're much, 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 much bigger than one. So even at a small scale, it may make sense to use matter to write your stuff down and toss it. So once I saw that, that kind of freaked me out a little bit. And remember in this equation, D, D gets larger and larger and larger, that really begins to favor matter a lot. So let's make D really, really, really big. Okay. So everybody 
probably has seen something like this. Uh, everybody know what that is? This is the Voyager spacecraft. Uh, it's sitting out. It's almost out of the solar system, and it will be all, uh, almost out of the solar system for the foreseeable future, because uh, space is big. This uh, disk here is, I wish I had a blow up. I do have a blow up of it, but in a different context. It has information that was put on it. I don't know what it says, OK? Uh, it's supposed to be for an alien civilization that captures the spacecraft and knows that you know, we're people. Um, and th I mean, there's a record on the back of how many of you, <laughs> I'm sorry, how many of you, because I'm looking at the kids, and they probably say, what is he talking about? How many of you remember LPs? Yeah. OK, there you go. It's an LP. It's an LP in bronze. And, and they even packed a little stylus. Remember the needle? A little stylus in it. I'm, not, I'm dead serious. This, you, know, you can't make this up. Um, but here's an interesting sort of thing. If you figure that this disk, with all of the information it has on it, is about a gigabit, so you've got to ask, when is the break-even point? When is it more efficient to send Voyager out than it is to radiate to try to send a message? And the answer is about 2,000 light years. Right? And for reference, our Milky Way galaxy is about 100,000 light years across. So that's surprising. Surprising that this simple-minded spacecraft gets more efficient than sending a message radiatively at 2,000 light years. And wait, they put that thing on that big, heavy gold disk. If you did something like use three DVDs, the distance goes down by a factor of 10. If you used a single gram of RNA, the distance goes down by a million. Now you're not even, I mean, you're just barely outside of the solar system is the point. So, huh, what's going on here? So now let's actually compare the fundamental theory. Oh my god, there's that graph. I'm going to come back to that. Yeah, no, and you, I, I, I almost pointed this and blinded you, you know, bad, and then I, that would have been very bad, professor, very bad, but you guessed, right, at that, when you looked at that. And I, I agree, it's a very complicated <laughs> figure. So I'm going to skip that figure and tell you this. How many of you have been to Puerto Rico? How many of you have been to the Arecibo? How many of you have seen the Arecibo dish? OK. So I would invite you to stand up and tell us about that almost religious experience. This thing is huge. It's huge. It's built into a valley, essentially. And the notion here is, let's say you have a mouth, the Arecibo dish, on Earth, and you're trying to send a message out into space, and at the other end, there's another Arecibo-sized dish to pick it up. So that's the setup. And what we're going to do is we're going to compare the amount of energy it takes to send that message using that big Arecibo dish and receiving it with the big Arecibo dish as compared to taking a piece of matter and launching it out into space, well, starting from space. I don't, air, I, I don't like air. Air is bad. Uh, but launching it out from space and getting it to a similar, uh, to a similar destination some, I'll say, 10, uh, 10 K light years away. So there's our ratio again, radiation energy to matter energy. The relative amount of energy that it would take to send that same message 10,000 light years away, which is not that far in terms of galactic distances, is about that ratio. So take a five pound sugar uh, sack and put it on a shelf. That's for writing, or detonate a 24 megaton warhead. That's the relative energy. And you know, for the uh, science types among you, that's about 10 to the 15th. Right? So let's see, billion, trillion, quadrillion. Okay? That's the amount of energy. Now that, and this I'll, I'll stop and you know, lose a little bit of the smile, because I, you know, it's, uh, it's actually kind of serious. When you are presented with those sorts of numbers, you can't ignore them, is the point. Those sorts of numbers, those are huge. And the Shannon theory allows us to say with definitive accuracy that this is the lower bound, meaning you can't do better. You can't send more bits radiatively. This is the maximum number of bits you can send for that amount of energy. It's, a, it's fixed. So you, you see something like this, and it kind of changes your worldview. You changed my world view about communications. So now we let that sink in. And then you say, oh, wait, wait, stop. Stop a second. Come on, you're pulling something over on me. So there's a bunch of stuff, right? First off, uh, you know, 
This one actually favors matter. So if you were not in this lecture hall right now and you came by at 4 o'clock, okay, you won't hear me. <laughs> right? The energy that I'm, that I'm using to try to communicate, it's gone. Right? It's no longer there. So there's impermanence versus repetition. That favors matter. But you know, let's take that off the table for the time being. I mean, I actually, I actually did a calculation that's kind of silly, uh, but I won't tell you about it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, now, there's a bunch of other things that you know, we would need to worry about, but this one is perhaps the biggest one that's the most obvious. So here's the thing. I want to communicate with you. So what I, right now, I'm talking to you, but I'm actually talking to everybody. The energy that I'm sending is going everywhere. What if I wanted to send a piece of matter to everybody? Oh, man, that's going to multiply the amount of energy you got to use, right? OK. So, Let's do that calculation again. So what we're comparing now, remember with the Arecibo dish, we had this big dish and we were focusing the energy as best as we could, right? Now what we're going to do is say, no dish at our end. We're just going to radiate everywhere. Because what we want to do is get our message out to everybody who could possibly listen. And with matter, we're going to have to duplicate that message and send it to each and every, 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 every place. And I'm going to be solar centric. And what that means is I'm only going to send the messages to star systems. I'm not sending it to the stuff in between. Okay? And that's a reasonable sort of thing to think about, at least as far as we know. So here we go. Here's the Milky Way galaxy, 100,000 light years across. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that we're in galaxies that are spherical. Not the case. That's not the way galaxies are for the most part, past a certain size. But it's a big ball, and it's going to have a certain radius, a certain size. So as the ball gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, the number of stars in that galaxy is going to go up as the cube of the size of the galaxy. Right? And again, once you get past a million light years, there's no galaxy that we know of that's a spherical galaxy that's that big. But we're going to just take this ad infinitum, almost, and look at the Milky Way. So here are the numbers. And really, all, the num all you really need to see here is look at this. Look at the number of stars, and that means the number of places you've got to send a package. That's the, th that's the thing to remember here. And over here, that's the relative efficiency of matter. So 10 to the fourth light years, 10,000 light years, there's a lot of stars, but the efficiency is really a lot, 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 lot bigger. So it's still good to send a, you can send a message, and you still, you know, you're making out like a bandit still. Let's make it a little bigger. All right, now this is, a light, this is a galaxy a million light years, 10 times larger than the Milky Way, and just as dense as the core of the Milky Way, which is ridiculous too. So I'm trying to favor radiation, put more stars in there. Well, a lot of stars. Uh, the efficiency is still a lot larger. And let's just keep on going. All right, that's uh, 10 times larger still. And larger still. There's the observable universe. Uh, everybody, or some folks know, 13.7, right? 13.7 billion light years. Huge, huge, huge. Well, a lot of stars. And again, this is a spherical galaxy with the same density as the Milky Way that's as, as large as the visible universe. Again, ridiculous, but it favors radiation. 10 to the 29 stars up, the efficiency of matter is still a whole lot larger. So the point is, for anything that we could possibly think about, uh, and the one thing that I might be you know, throwing under the rug here is that I'm going to allow a leisurely C over 1,000, 1,000 times slower than the speed of light for the message to get there. This is still much more efficient. So you know, what I'm expecting at this point is you know, appropriate awe. <laughs> right? So I think that this work, it says that you know, matter is the way to go. For So once you do that, now you start really thinking about stuff. These are big questions, right? If it's more efficient to send matter, you know, well, the first thing I want to talk about, because everybody usually wants to talk about listening for aliens, finding aliens, doing communication with aliens. Hello, alien. How are you? Hi, alien. The problem is that even at the speed of light, that takes a ridiculous amount of time. The closest star is four light years away. So that's an eight light year round trip. Uh, if you're talking about the local area, you know, civilizations don't last as long sometimes. So I ask a question, why communicate at all? And you know, there's some sociability in here, maybe. Now, you'll notice that uh, I put this, I'll use this guy, Alien Psychology 101. That's really tongue in cheek. I don't know how I think. 
I definitely don't know how my wife or my sister thinks, okay? I don't know how aliens think. So, you know, all I, I'm just, I'm making this up as I go along. So maybe that's a reason to communicate. All right, so, you know, here's one reason. Hey, you know, come find us. And this is tongue in cheek, but the basic idea here is that you put something in the local milieu, like out in one of our asteroid belts or somewhere that can be found, and they find it, they read the information, and whoa, they're part of the galactic community now. Wow, isn't this great? And that's a possibility. Maybe, maybe folks want to do that. Uh, this is for the really older people in the audience, okay? And I'll just leave it at that and let you younger people figure it out yourselves. Uh, here's another one, just, you know, hello, universe. You know, here we are, uh, bring technology. And, but then if you talk to Stephen Hawking, who some of you may know, he's a very famous physicist, you know, basically his thing is don't do that. Because uh, <laughs> they might come and eat you. Uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm being tongue in cheek, but I mean, there is some, Time, uh, galactic time, you know, geological time is long, right? So the odds are that, you know, if they can actually read something that we've sent, they may be technologically way ahead of us. And, you know, resources are always scarce. <laughs> so, you know, go watch V, you know. <laughs> now, to me, going back to kind of a science-y sort of thing, there is, a, there is one truth, and I think that truth is survival. And that's why evolution works. It's not a matter of I have a survival instinct. I don't buy that. It's just that I do things that maybe let my progeny live a little bit longer, and they do things that let their progeny live a little bit longer and uh, propagate. So the point of evolution is <laughs> the, reason, the only reason we're all here is that our ancestors didn't die before they had children. And that's a bottom line. And that's that, I think, is universal. So, you know. You know, this is, uh, you'll all recognize what's going on here. And the point is that we live on a fragile little blue ball. Uh, we could jack it up that way, right? You know, all the, that's not been discussed or uh, people don't believe it, but you know, we could jack up the planet. Um, we could get a little bit too uh, aggressive and mess up the planet. There's other things that we could do, all right? Uh, that's happened before, right? Big rock smacks into the Earth, asteroid. That has happened. That was the Cretaceous dis uh, extinction. So we live on this fragile ball. So the point is, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't resist that one. That, that's the other, <laughs> that's, that's the other ending. Uh, so I'm going with survival. So I look at it as the survivors, in a galactic sense, are the ones who write. Uh, those who don't, game over. And it's, it's completely agnostic. You know, I'm not saying, oh, bad people that didn't write. Oh, good people who wrote. The ones that wrote propagate their, uh, their biome, their genes, their whatever, throughout. Those that didn't, don't. And if you live on a fragile little rock, and there seem to be a lot of fragile little rocks out there. Uh, we now, I got a friend up at Harvard who's a planet hunter. And there's a lot of rocks. We didn't know this 10 years ago, that there were so many rocks on which things could happen around stars. We could see the stars, but we couldn't see the rocks around them. Now we can, and there's lots of them. There's more rocks than stars. So you begin to wonder, is biological information transmission, is that standard operating procedure? There's stuff flying in all around us, and we just don't know it. Maybe we're the aliens, right? And you know, you're looking at me like, oh god, he's out of his mind. But, <laughs> but you can't deny the, uh, the efficiency of the communication medium. So how to send, how to detect, We'll you know, play some games here. There's a comet. That's my favorite. Uh, unfortunately, it kind of sucks because they're not persistent enough. But I love the idea that when a comet comes near a sun, its little tail lights up. And all that means is that it's outgassing stuff that could fall onto a planet. That makes me happy. Uh, there's maybe a more directed sort of way. You, you put something in a rock, and you send it somewhere. And uh, when it gets there, little rock, not a big rock. Uh, when it gets there, it drops whatever biological material it is off there. And if the rock is hospitable, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Uh, that's a little bit more antisocial, um, and that's why there's a dinosaur there. <laughs> right? So, you know, there's all sorts of ways to do it. Now, can you detect it? And that's a fundamental thing, and that's actually a question that I'm trying to work on, but it's kind of hard to frame in the right sort of way. The reason is that if, you know, I showed you this picture, and it wasn't in this talk, and I just said, is this real? Does this exist? And you look at it and say, oh my god, what the heck is that? that? Somebody had to have thought of that. Biology 
has done so many amazing things. Yes, that's actually real. Uh, these guys are just engineered. They're genetically engineered. So the point is, is there an incursion? Can you tell whether something arrived from somewhere else? Mm, I don't know how to frame the problem yet, but I'm working on it. Um, that's almost not really that relevant. The point here is that if you do a simple-minded calculation, like some people in this SETI field, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence do, if you do a simple sort of thing, this is an analog to the Drake equation. Um, and, you know, I won't say what I think. I like Frank. I don't, won't, won't say what I say about it as his equation. But um, the number of parcels per star could be large, is the point. So there may be lots of stuff out there that we haven't really looked at yet and don't know how to look at because we're kind of trapped. If you could feel kind of claustrophobic, right? You know, the world is big, but we're kind of trapped on it. Um, maybe we can't, we haven't seen it because we haven't been out far enough. So all of this resulted in 15 seconds of fame for me. Um, uh, cover story in nature. Most of the people uh, in my field, you know, I come to think of it, I think I'm the only communication theorist yet that's gotten the cover of nature. So yay me. Um, <laughs> Uh, that's great, and I had a, I had a partner in crime, uh, Greg Wright, he's an, he's an astronomer, and we met at Bell Laboratories way back when. Uh, there's some really chill perks about uh, getting a paper into nature. So, you know, there were interviews where I got to opine and stuff, you know, and you can see we just love to opine. Uh, I got a New York Times article, the, the thing got a New York Times article by Dennis Overby. Uh, really nice guy, uh, very incisive, smart as hell. Uh, there was an editorial written about uh, this work, because again, it's kind of a fundamental worldview game changer. And now I got a really cool thing to talk about it. Cocktail parties, right? <laughs> so, you know, Jim, Jim uh, Gates, my physicist friend, he's, you know, he can say, well, you know, I, I study the fundamental structure of the universe and matter. And, and you say, ooh. You know, now I don't have to say just communication theorists. I say, I ask big questions. So <laughs> that, that, makes me, that makes me really happy. So there was some not so chill perks, though. Um, I do some expert witnessing. Because I'm an engineer, sometimes you get called in, patent disputes, things like that. So this has happened now three times. I paraphrased here. Um, so, you know, the standard sort of stuff, Dr. Rose, blah, 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 blah. You know, who are you? What do you do? Whatever. And then the next question is, do you talk to space aliens? <laughs> <laughs> so again, you know, if any of you have ever been in a courtroom, you know, you can imagine. But luckily, I have good answers. Um, so that's great. The conclusion here, so if you've fallen asleep, right, wake up. Here's the conclusion, and here are the takeaway messages. The first one is, if you got a little time, meaning you don't have to get it absolutely there right away immediately, throw the message to the recipient. That's the most energetically efficient way to do things. That's number one. Uh, number two, this one kind of freaked me out. It wasn't my words, but it freaked me out because uh, scientists, engineers, we don't, with rare exception, I can think of a couple, but with rare exception, we don't tend to be bombastic. We present you with evidence, you look at the evidence, you assess the evidence, and then we all come to a consensus. It's not a matter of, I said this, and that's the law. We all discuss. What, so I wasn't thinking about this in terms of policy, but uh, when the editors of Nature did the paper, they put this, this is, I, for, for many folks, this is not a big deal. But this is a very bold, right in your face statement that we should do it now. So that's probably part of the reason that there was the Times and the, everybody went crazy about this. Now, that's great, but if you haven't heard, I'm not necessarily a big proponent of communication. Communication usually implies a two-way street. Why the distances, when you actually start thinking about these distances in terms of what we can do, they are ridiculous distances, which means ridiculous amounts of time. So I'm not sure that this whole communication paradigm, you know, oh, alien, there you are. Yes, here we are. And we do this back and forth. That just leaves me cold. So my take on all of this is that maybe the fundamental result here, given the fragility of everything and, you know, how, the, uh, and how efficient uh, matter communication is, maybe we should be seeding, is the point, as a hedge as for posterity, as a hedge against extinction. So if there's three things you take away today, it's those three things, right? Throw the message to the recipient if you got some time. Uh, maybe there's stuff out there right now that we can't see, and maybe we should be sending it out. And my take is I'm not going to send you the Encyclopedia Galactica. I'm probably going to send you shock troops in the form of little balls that are going to grow when they land on your planet. 
and to us. All right, now, so that, those are the three takeaways, and that's basically the end of the talk, but not really. Right? I started this saying that you know, we all have our different motivations, and mine was a lot of physics envy. So you know, the real takeaway is you know, if you've got big questions, real, I mean, really big fundamental questions that are you know, pressing and everybody should be worried about, ask a communication theorist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so we have, I don't know what the sketch, I know we are, thank God there was a clock back there because this could have gone on forever, trust me, because I can talk. Uh, but we have time for questions and there are microphones. And what I would suggest, you can get up and do the microphones, but what I like doing is just take the microphone and grab it and pass it around. So please. Yeah, just, have a, just was thinking about what you were saying and I was just wondering whether you have a point of view about whether quantum communications changes what you're thinking about and thinking about entanglement and great distances and all that. Right, so that's a, so the, I'm right here. So the question is, so the, the, the fundamental thing there is that if I have an object here and I emit two, let's just to keep, to keep it simple, you emit two photons from this particular, I'm blinded. <laughs> you emit it from this particular point and they propagate out in different directions. Quantum theory tells us that if we measure the one that over there, we'll immediately know something about the, uh, the particle that was over there. And that's freaky, right? But it's true. It's freaky, but it's true. In that particular scenario, though, there's still the propagation, right? There's still the aim. I can't take that photon and send it directly to that place because uh, uh, Heisenberg, uncertainty principle, you can't really tell where it's going to be, so we end up with the same aperture effects. So the point is, if I'm going to communicate, there has to be some sort of relay in the middle here that modulates it here. That guy, I'm sorry folks, but that was a semi-tech, that was a pretty nice technical question. The, I have to modulate the information on it here and the places that are the, where the distant communication is happening is between those two places. It's actually happening between here and there. So the quantum model doesn't really work for this sort of communication is the point. Because it's not that you sent a, a particle from there to here, it's something in the middle. And so you still end up with the same propagation times, the same energy density issues. And you know, if you want to do it that way, you could imagine you know, sending particles uh, from here to both places, but it's not, but I agree. There's instantaneous communication there, but you need some sort of relay in the middle. And then if you're distant, that thing over there isn't affecting what's happening over here. If you, if you see what I'm saying. Okay, did I answer your question though? Okay, sorry, could you kind of, could you kind of like grab the mic? No, no, stay, 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 stay. Just grab the mic and give it. Yeah, yeah. thank you. <laughs> I was just wondering, um, you, you said you were critical of the Drake equation. I was hoping you might comment on that. Uh, there's a, so the Drake equation is built out of it's a uh, there's a Fermi question. So for example, I could ask you, how many piano tuners are there in Chicago? That's a classic Fermi uh, question. And you say, why is he asking me this stupid question? The point is that there's, you could actually get a pretty close approximation because it's a product of terms. There's, what's the population in Chicago? How many houses have I been in that have had pianos? There's a whole bunch of different factors in there, okay? The Drake equation has a lot of different factors. And a lot of them are just completely, you know, intangible. Okay, like how many intelligent life forms are there out there? No idea. Uh, what's their loquacity level? Meaning, how much do they want to talk? So the point is, if you had even a hand, now we have a good handle now on the number of rocks that are out there that uh, Frank didn't have originally. But even with that, the rest of the equation, there's too many factors that you just don't know anything about. So that's why when I put my equation up, it's no better. I'm not saying it's better than Frank's equation. It's just that there's fewer imponderables, but where the nugget of the imponderable is, is you know, are people sending things out and you know, how often and things like that. So the Drake equation makes me, you know, I look at it, it's a, it's a guide, but it's not a really, it doesn't satisfy the quantitative person in me. Did I answer your question though? And you know, we can fight about it too. <laughs> it, 
I'm sort of tying this to SETI, and I'm not sure if that's fair to you, but... No, 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 Jill, I know, I know okay. all these people. Um, my, my problem with SETI has always been why, because we can't go there and they can't come here. If we're, we're if, you, if I can use an analogy, we're on a ship in the middle of the Pacific Ocean and it's on fire. The fact that there is rescue boats four days away isn't going to help us out. And you couched it in sort of a, a well for survivability and, and things like that. So my question still is, why? Why bother? Because we've got bigger problems that are here that aren't, that's not going to help us. And I agree with you completely. Sorry, Jill. Uh, I, invite, I invited Jill here to give, uh, Jill is uh, Madam Setti, so Jill Tarter, um, just to you know, give you, because we all know each other. After this paper hit, you know the Seti people had, were going crazy. It's like, what do you mean you shouldn't use radio? No, you know, so that, but the point is, and I guess the point that I'm trying to make, so Jill's work, she does Seti. That's what she's uh, devoted her life to. That's what a lot of people have devoted their lives to. They are astronomers, though. What they're doing is they're looking up at the stars. So they're gathering information that's coming in. A byproduct of that could be maybe there's a message coming in, but there's actual real astronomy. So for that reason alone, Jill, give her all the money she wants, let her look at the stars, because she's going to learn some new physics. But in terms of communication, I'm with you. Sorry, I don't believe in this communication thing. So the lifeboat business is simply we either do or we don't. We should damn sure try not to be that polar bear, you know, sitting on that piece of ice. We should damn sure try not to be, uh, blow ourselves up. Certainly, certainly, certainly. But knowing what I know or think I know about folks, you know, we, there's no central control, these things are still possible. So what I'd say is it's not a matter of communication. It's a matter of, you know, a horrible word, but uh, colonization and persistence. It's a matter of persistence. That, that's the cleaned up version. So I agree with you, is the point. But I do think that maybe you want to hedge your bets, especially if it's not as costly as you thought it was, and send some, send some rocks out there with some piece of the biome on it. And that's, now, what, I'm not going to say this word to you, OK? But if you look up the stuff that I'm talking about, there's a word. Uh, Crick coined it. And if you look at it on the internet, the lunatic fringe, you, you will see some crazy people. Uh, but that's kind of what I'm talking about, uh, seeding the universe. Okay. Um, to the, I, actually, I can do that if it's okay. All right, so you talked earlier about the Arecibo thing. Yes. Why are we still funding that? Is that like politics or like why is there, if we know already and we've known for years that th there's a better option, why are we still doing the worst option? Oh. Arecibo is a telescope, just like the Green Bank Telescope in North Carolina uh, is, a, is just a telescope. They're, they're actually doing science. But if you're doing science and the information coming in, the storing the information and analyzing it is cheap. So Arecibo, Arecibo needs to exist because it's a big eyeball out on the universe. What we do with the data, different story. Okay? And I say, again, here, Jill, take it. And, uh, and the Allen Telescope Array, do it. I'm not particularly interested unless you discover something, you know, then, then, I'm, then I'm really interested, as we all are, <laughs> right? But uh, I think there's, there's natural science that you should do. So these projects, I think, need to be funded simply because there's byproducts. It's like, why did we go to the moon, okay? It's like stupid, why, you know, geology, right? No, I, no. The reason we went to the moon, honest to God, my whole discipline of electrical engineering is all about parking a nuclear warhead in people's laps, okay? And I'm dead serious. That's, that's what communication theory is about, control theory, electrical engineering. So there are byproducts, like the internet and everything else, that the moonshot, 69, kind of coalesced around and developed a lot of technology. But there are ancillary benefits, is the point. So I, that was kind of a meandering sort of question. But the point is, that's not the only thing that the Arecibo telescope is doing. Did I, did I answer your no, question, you though, yeah. rather than blow hard? You did. OK, thank you. One more question. All right, I get, yeah, one more, because you're off to your next thing. Oh, oh, um, my, my illustrious sister said, take one more question. Is there one more question? It's 2 o'clock, excuse me, 3 o'clock. There are no more questions. All right, thank you so much. <laughs>